aside from the obvious, right. that Amy Mahalovic's killer is potentially still out there, right. why is this story so, so important today? For anybody who grew up in Northeast Ohio at the time, this is a story you just cannot forget. And I know for me personally, I was a child when this happened, and I remember what that Halloween was like that year. A lot of trick-or-treating had been canceled. Um, there was this incredible fear of stranger danger that would happen to Amy, could happen to any child at that time. And I think it's just one of those cases that really was an end of innocence for a lot of us, realizing that bad things could happen and that not all adults could be trusted. And I know as kids we were afraid, as adults we were, what happened to Amy, extremely rare, but it just made it possible that something like this could happen. You have a 10-year-old girl, she's in middle school, she agrees to meet a stranger after school who lures her to a shopping plaza to buy a present for her mom. Her parents are having trouble in their marriage, she just wants to make her mom happy, and she agrees to go, and she was a smart girl, she knew better. I mean, kids that age do, they know not to go off with strangers, but she did, and so I think there are a lot of things that this forced us to talk about in our own families as to what headspace, how our kids are that, you know, they could be persuaded to do something like this. And as we know, um, four months later, her body ended up um, discovered in Ashland County and her killer has never been caught. And you were a kid at this time as well growing yep. up. How old were you when Amy disappeared? So I was 13. I'm 43 today. So, um, yeah, that, that 13 years old, I could relate to that. Amy would have been 10, so I would have been a few older than, years older than her. And in our podcast, we bring in James Renner, who's really a known crime writer and who's really made something of a career out of this case. He's written a book about Amy. He stays on top of this case. He regularly circles back with investigators, people who knew her, and really is the kind of go-to resource for this. And he was a little bit younger than me, right between my age and Amy's age. And if you listen to the podcast, he tells some really relatable stories that I think people in Northeast Ohio can relate to. Um, Westgate Mall, he used to go up to Westgate Mall. He talks about playing video games up there. And then when Amy disappears, he goes up there um, trying to find her killer, seeing if maybe it's some person creeping around the parking wow. lot as a little boy and he is taking it upon himself. And as he gets the resources of an adult, he continues to try to find out what he can about her killer because clearly it impacted him so much as a child too. And as you mentioned, the whole idea of stranger danger is still very yeah. prevalent today. That yeah. was obviously very prevalent at that time. Is there anything really specific that strikes out in your mind when you were a child from the time of her murder that you remember? I remember trick-or-treating. I remember, and, and even to this day, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've said to my own children that, you know, there's this girl, Amy Mahalovic, and this is what happened. I mean, it, she becomes sort of the, the story that we tell because she is the worst case scenario. She is proof that this happens even though, again, we, we, we pull data from the National Centers for Missing and Exploited Children. It's less than 1% of a child being abducted by a non-family member. I mean, the vast majority of kids who disappear are runaways. Um, about 4%, it's usually a family member or some kind of creepy person that's already in your life. What happened to Amy is less than 1%, but you can't say this never happens because it did. And I know even with the conversations I have with my own kids, her name comes up. And so looking back on that, um, it's just the, the, the possibility that this can happen. And, and even scarier, perhaps, is the fact that the person responsible has never been caught, has never been brought to justice. Um, it, it almost takes you back and, you know, I'm 43, but I still feel like I'm 13 when I, when I think about that because it's scary. You know, you can relate to what it, it must have been like for her when she realized that this person she was meeting was not somebody who meant good, but was somebody who would eventually end her life. Right, and we know very little about how much time transpired between right. that meeting right. to when she was eventually killed. We can only guess. And I can tell you this, Stephanie, this was interesting too, as we talk about the impact that this has on us as adults. We had identified people who knew her at the time, witnesses, um, people who you know may not have had information connected to her disappearance, but we wanted to just talk to them and get a little bit of local color. What was it like growing up with Amy? What was she like? You know, just kind of those character reference interviews. And a number of people said no, just because of the fact that the killer hasn't been caught. Granted, this guy was going after little girls. I don't, we don't know if he would go after adults, but they just didn't want to put their names out there. They didn't want to be connected to it in a public way because there's still that, you know, if he did it once, maybe he could do it again. And maybe it's best for me not to come forward and, and talk now, even after all this time. And I found that to be something really interesting about the impact that it had on, on them as adults. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a really great point that those people make and this being a five-part series there's so much information yes. in here so that was clearly one roadblock that you had in putting that together were yeah. there any other major roadblocks 
It, the access to certain p interviews, and then this was the first time I've ever done a podcast, so just writing something that long, like you know here on Facebook Live we can talk and talk and talk, <laughs> but with right. a television story, um, you, you know, you're often limited to a minute 30, two minutes, three minutes, um, and we're doing a multi-part series so that we can share as much as we possibly can with our viewers. The challenge for me though is writing my first podcast and writing something that long that times out to about an hour and a half. For me personally, there was a bit of um, growth, so I hope people listening, uh, you know, give me a pass for that because that was something that was new for me personally, well, and it was. I can tell it was you, a challenge. I listened to the full podcast the day it dropped. It dropped on Sunday. Yeah. It was phenomenal. I learned so much information. You were great as Thank the narrator you. and also the person who compiled all of these facts and all of this information. I had some great help, Phil Trexler, James mm -hmm. Renner, Susan Moses, but yay. thank you for that. Absolutely, and even though it is an hour and a half, right? That's yep. a movie, yeah, right? It is. That's feature length. <laughs> yeah. But there are some things get, get left on the cutting room, cutting room floor. Is it's there true. anything that got cut that you would like to share with our live streamers? You know, I, I, I it's funny when you ask that question, I, I think more might have gotten cut from our TV series, so I want to say if people are interested in what they've seen in our TV reporting so far, we, we really did not cut that much um, on the cutting room floor of our podcast. That was the beauty of the podcast. We had no time limit. I think the one thing that I would have liked to have maybe talked about a little bit more, and I think that's really important to our viewers, and you have, you're an attorney, you have a background on this, and you know some of the legalities that come when you're doing something like this. We did not want to name suspects. No one has ever been charged. And so it was a very delicate process to talk about suspects without wanting to reveal their names or make them identifiable. Sure. And that was very, very important because few cases have as many suspects, it seems, as this one does, which is really scary because to think that there are that many people that the family think, thinks could have possibly done it is a scary thought in itself. But um, we wanted to be very careful about that. And I think that it would have been interesting maybe, in hindsight, to talk a little bit more with James about how he confronted every single person that had been accused. Every person who has e emerged as a suspect, he has actually personally met with, spoken to. Wow. And the interesting thing about that is they expected him to show up. They were like almost relieved. I mean, they wanted to clear their names, but they, he, he mentioned to me, and there's a, there's a brief soundbite in the, in the podcast about how just, there's this, yeah, thanks for showing up and asking us for our side. And it would have been more interesting to dive into that, but again, the concern would be if we did that, we wouldn't want to reveal identities. But you know, when, the, if and when this is ever solved, it, it, there will be so many more questions and, and it will be fun to circle back and see which of these theories actually panned out. So you mentioned if and when this is ever solved. Yeah. You've talked to the FBI, you've talked to the yeah. Bay Village Police. What kind of a sense do you get from them? Do they never have Never been hope? closer. Really? They're saying never been closer. Okay. Because you know what? We, we hear so much about forensic science and technology, and the technology has never been better. And um, what we'll get into is nuclear DNA versus mitochondrial DNA. Nuclear DNA being things like skin, um, blood, things that, are, that are, are much more sort of associated with our body. Mitochondrial comes from our hair. And when you think of like golden state and getting a full profile, you need that nuclear DNA. And the problem with this case is even though they had those hairs, they could never plug those into the same databases. Well now, a paleogeneticist from the University of Southern California has developed a way that they can actually do that kind of nuclear DNA profile based on a hair, wow. which something at, at, at this time even a year ago was thought to be impossible, even a few months ago was thought to be impossible. So now if they can get that full DNA profile, and you know this is all protected stuff, we don't know if they've been in touch with this guy or, or you know they're not going to comment to that extent of detail about the investigation, but we can only imagine now with that technology being available that they're going to be able to get something that could produce a better hit from those hairs. And that is the exciting part. And where we are today, you mentioned the Golden State Killer. It's not like this person has had to offer up a DNA sample. If there's a first right. relative, exactly. we can find a match. We've seen cases where they have done matches back to like the 1800s for people. Wow. So if they are able to get a nuclear DNA composite based on one of these hairs, they could potentially match it to a family member and then back their way into finding out who this person is. Now I do want to say that there are three hairs, three different people. There are different ways those hairs could have come into contact with Amy's body, maybe the car that she was in. Um, James talks about how body bags had been reused in that day, so it could be a contaminated body bag. But at the very least, you know, if you know somebody who might have been in the car that was used to transport her to the killer's home, you could start asking people where they were in 1989 and have a lead that just hasn't been there before. And that, I think, is, it's either going to be DNA, which we're, we're getting better at, or conversations like this, our series, our podcast, 
we'll get somebody to maybe come forward and give that tip that they've not wanted to give in 30 years. I mean, that's why we keep ultimately the, the heart of it stories like this alive, is that right. somebody needs to talk, somebody has to know something. You can't, you can't do something like this and get away with it without somebody picking up on it. Right. Well, I just dropped all of those links into the live stream so you cool. can catch the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Yep. Uh, make sure you check that out. It's really fascinating. Good really reviews help too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Subscribe, download, yeah. review the podcast. Very right. important so that we can do more projects like this here. Absolutely. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Drew. Stephanie. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity.